Hello. It's very nice to be here. <laughs> Hello, I'm Rosie. I'm and I'm Harriet. Um, and we started Tatty Divine nearly 13 years ago. Yeah, we met at art school in Chelsea where we were studying painting. Um, and I ended up to sleep on my floor. <laughs> yeah. um, here's some pictures of us from over the years. Um, we were yeah, both studying painting and stumbled across some leather and started making fashion accessories. Yeah, we found about 18 sacks full of leather outside an up upholstery shop and dragged it into my flat. And um, then we invented some wristbands and took them to the market and we made £50. Pounds. We're like, yeah. this is quite good. <laughs> so with that £50, pounds, we did a stall the next Saturday and we made £300, pounds, I think. And we just kept selling on the market stall. We literally started with nothing. Well, we started with student debt and overdrafts. Um, but because we started then, we didn't need anything either because we were pretty much used to living with no money at all, which really helped. <laughs> we put all our energy and time into building Tatty Divine. Because um, we first met um, at college, but we were also working together um, at the Victorian Albert Museum, which sounds more glamorous than it was because we were doing <laughs> catering. But we found we became really firm friends and realised that we made fantastic a fantastic partnership that had a dynamic that... Well, we trusted each other and we both had a similar kind of passion and, and we're kind of into the same things, weren't we? And uh, we both came from mothers and grandmothers who made things. One of Rosie's earliest memories is that she wasn't allowed a real Care Bear, she had to have a homemade one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and e equally, Ooh. my mum also made all of our clothes and in Rosie's house it was called stress making, not dress making. <laughs> <laughs> So we just used to love making things. We used to get together in Rosie's bedroom and we got old floorboards we found on the street and used to make a little place where that would be our studio and we would <laughs> make things and draw pictures of things that we wanted to make. What's Here, jewellery? Here's some examples of um, some of the jewellery that we've, we've become quite well known for. Um, we started cutting out of using acry acrylic perspex in, what, 2003? Like 2002. Um, we, on a trip to New York, it was actually 9-11, wasn't it? came home and, well, just after, just before. Um, but we found all this perspex cut out. It was a sign maker's, and we just saw it and thought, that would be incredible jewellery. Um, so we came back and thought, where are we going to... How, how are we going to do that? How are we going to do this? Bearing in mind, there was a, a computer room at college, but we didn't know how to get into yeah. it. And there was one computer <laughs> in the library that I didn't know how to turn on. The internet was... A to well, it was just starting up, but it was such a mystery to us. We had no idea... And no way of sourcing anything either, whereas now if I want a particular width webbing end, I can just Google it and buy it, and it's <laughs> with me the next day. When we first started, to work, to work out how to join our cuffs together, my mum rang Radio Kent, to see, and we went to go and see someone who made <laughs> saddles to try and find the appropriate findings for the leatherware. <laughs> Somehow we discovered a sign maker in East London, near where we were working, and he was a model maker and a sign maker, and we gave him some drawings, and he started cutting them out for us. And that's when we started doing the name necklaces as well, which um, we just made for our friends. Harriet drew out all the names, and we um, gave them as Christmas presents to our friends. And then people kept asking about it. And it's, one of, it's our most best one. Well, it's our best-selling product. Um, it's been fantastic. I know, I mean, gradually, we built up quite a collection of shapes and iconic kind of... Icons. <laughs> when, when we first started, we used to make things out of um, already made objects like the plectrums and tape measures because we didn't have the technology. But what laser cutting gave for us was a way of making things without any minimum quantities. And because our ideas were slightly off the wall and people thought we were a bit bonkers, it was great because there was no way we were ever going to make any kind of minimum quantities to be able to make anything mass produced. And neither did we really want to either. Um, we make everything in the UK. Well, we make everything in London and Kent. This is um, this is our studio. You can see. We used to make everything in the back of our shop. But, um, when we first started, we used to make everything in our bedrooms. Um, some of our first orders were just made sitting in the garden, sewing thousands of gems on things, and we had to rope in some of our friends to come and do it, who weren't very good at making things. We've now got an incredible team of, I think we've got 12 people full-time making, spread across the two locations, but um, we've got three laser cutters now, and it's all we make it all here, and it's got an incredible workforce, all really skilled and really, really 
into making jewellery. And that's what's really beautiful about it, is that it's, it's all about taking through the passion for making, really. Yeah, and over the past 12 years, we've really developed a technique of making jewellery that didn't really exist quite in the format that we do it now. Mm. <laughs> we've got two shops. Um, the one on the left is Brick Lane, which we opened in 2000. And the one on the right is in Covent Garden that we opened three or four years ago, coming up to four years ago. And they've been a really, really, really powerful tool for us because they've been, been able to sort of slap our identity all over them. And it's been somewhere where people can come. And we've always held loads of events, um, kind of inviting like-minded people. I think surrounding yourself with people doing similar things or interested in similar things is really helpful. It's completely key, absolutely. Because you just sort of g each other on and you, and you learn so much from people going through the same experiences, not necessarily trying to do jewellery design or whatever, but whether they're artists or filmmakers or musicians, they've all got a sort of key interest in, in doing something different. When we first took on Brick Lane, I mean, it was a very different space to what it is now because we used to work in there too, so it just gave us a real hub. It gave... Um, a place for people to visit and a place for us to really put our mark on. Mm. And meet the customers and find out what they really think and what they really want. Because we didn't really think that they were going to buy it in the first place. We used to hang it on the wall and look at it. <laughs> <laughs> and then people would come in and go, how much is it? And we'd have to make it up. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on how much we didn't want to sell it or how, how many we had in the drawer. Because when, when we first started, we would make record <laughs> earrings and it would be an, a case of driving to Portsmouth to a small news agent to go and buy the rest of their cape decorations <laughs> so that we could make the belts for Brown's Focus and they, did, they never knew. <laughs> or we would do pilgrimages to Paris to buy Eiffel Tower key rings because you couldn't just buy Eiffel Tower key rings on eBay. You had to <laughs> yeah. go and haggle with people at King Court. <laughs> um, this is our website as it looks, not today, but I think last week. Um, we were quite early, I think, making a website. I think we had one in 2003 or 2004. Very different format to it. It was very it is basic. Um, but we've just gone through the process in the last year of getting it up to date and exactly how we want it. Um, and you can see the variety of things that we do now. Um, across the top, we've got the Fine banner, which is our new um, sterling silver range. Um, and then on the right, we've got our, something from our spring summer collection, which is the watermelon necklace. So we work um, with two major collections a year. We, we run with the fashion cycle, and we show it at London Fashion Week. As well as that, we're always updating our mainline collection, which is... We worked, worked out about 18 months ago that you couldn't just do two collections anymore. You essentially have to do new product all the time. So we do about seven or eight collections a year, aside from the spring, summer, and autumn, <gasps> winter. But what we're about now is constant ideas, constant jewellery, and... and listening to our customers and what they want that's become a really focal point to what we do yeah. we also work with a lot of different shops galleries companies artists collaborations and partnerships have become really central to what we do as well yeah it's been it's been really um, amazing to work with such brilliant people with such lovely projects and you get to uh, meet amazing people and it, i mean it started off with just the artists that used to work in our shops we used to have like, we used to have exhibitions with, and it's just scaled up over the last few years. Mm. I'm trying to think of the first collaboration we did, but we did we worked with Rob Ryan about four or five years ago, and that was one of the nicest collaborations we did because we obviously love his work he's and he's a really good friend. So. so making his work into jewelry was really exciting. But more recently, um, well, the moment we're designing jewelry for Mary Portis's shop, as well as um, moving into Selfridges. Um, well, we had a pop-up shop there January and February. We're actually setting up a concession um, in April, which is very exciting. So working with these sort of, well, partnering with these big institutions is... So in art galleries as well, because mm. quite a large part of our market is art gallery shops, which we never knew when we first started because we were always uh, fashion shops. And actually, we work really well in art gallery shops. Mm. So it's a different avenue to take. We've been working with Tate for quite a few years now, doing special collections, and it's just so... It's such a brilliant way of finding different markets. It doesn't just have to be high-end boutiques. We work, as Harriet says, just so many different types of shops that we've we sort of spread it out, and it, and, it, and it means that there's a hugely different kind of array of customers that are into Tatty Divine. Yeah. Um, we've also won a few awards. There's Time Out have um, been sort of one of the best shops, I think for both shops, actually. Telegraph magazine, the best small shop in Britain. Not the best, but one of. One of, yeah. <laughs> um, as jewellery designers, it's been exciting. We were in the jewellery Hot 100, which had sort of 
who they consider the most important uh, jewellers of, of this time. Which was quite a nice recognition, because before, because we don't work in a classic jewellery sense, um, it's kind of like we've been accepted into the fold. It's actually, <laughs> it is jewellery now. Yeah. I've always felt like outsiders. <laughs> um, cool brands, as Emma said. Um, we, a couple of years in a row, we were one of the top 50, said to be one of the top 50 coolest brands. And we also uh, were nominated for the NatWest Every Woman Award um, last year, which was very exciting. Um, last year as well, we did a book. Yeah, that was um, a bit of an ordeal. So it was a kind of sit down and work out what it was over the last 12 years that we'd actually worked out and how come that I know that if you use that glue on that kind of material, it's going to break <laughs> and try and explain that to people. Um, with some lovely projects along the way. It's been an incredible tool. I think it's really, we've grown so much in the last two years and the book's been a really big part of that because it's reached out to so many people and also sharing, as Harriet says, sharing what we've learned or what she's learned or what she knows. <laughs> she just knows. I don't know how. <laughs> um, but that's been brilliant. And then here's, um, this is our pop-up that was in Selfridges where we were live laser cutting in store. So this was brilliant to be invited to do this. Um, in their concept store, we were. You could basically come along and order a name necklace and get it on the spot, which was. It felt like a. It felt quite an interesting thing to do, being in Selfridges, one of the most famous department stores in the world, and making the product in the shop. Yeah, it was also a challenge for us because obviously our laser cutters are in our studio and it's our safe environment. And I, if it sets on fire, I know what to do. But in Selfridges, if it sets on fire, Rolex next door, not going to be so happy. <laughs> and also that I'm not there, because if anything happens, it's usually, Harriet! <laughs> and I'm in there. So it was, it was a whole different level of trusting the girls and the machinery mm. to work properly and to be able to deliver that service when we hadn't done it before. And we went straight in and did it with the best department store in the world. Yeah. But it was so fabulous. They've invited us back. So hopefully we're there for a few years to come. Um, we're very excited about that because it feels like... Well, it's just so nice to be able to create stuff instantly for our customers. Um, really brilliant. Um, finally, this is our new range, Fine, which is um, some of the pieces we've been making over the years, laser cut in sterling silver, which... Wow. So we looked at getting this done with some other people and it was very much like, yes, we can do it. Yes, you have to have 300 made and yes, you have to make it in China. So we were like, no, we don't actually. What we'll do is we'll work out how we can do that in this country the same way that we do our jewellery with just a more powerful machine. So it's made in exactly the same way in Lincolnshire um, and then we finish it all off by hand in our studio. So it's got the same edge, as it were, as the acrylic jewellery, the same ethos. <laughs> So it's been it's quite been quite a long journey, but yes. and we feel like we've only just begun. <laughs> yeah, over the last two years, um, it's like we've really refocused and it's changed quite a lot compared to when we started, which is very much um, it was really really instinctive. Everything that we it was very organic. Did. We did everything, everything rolled into the next thing, and every penny we made we put back in, and we just we just kept putting it back in and and going to the next level. Um, but over the last two years, it's kind of we've just, we've kind of made a conscious decision to also let in other people who are very very good at what they do. Sort of surrounding ourselves with a certain amount of experts, like the people that did the website for us, um, and the people that have helped us with the branding, and just some nice little yeah. bits and pieces that have changed it and maybe cleared the way to make the jewelry the focus mm -hmm. as opposed to all the ra random other graphic design we used to do. <laughs> We realise that you've, it's very important to know what you want to achieve. I mean, the only way you're going to get to where you're trying to get to is if you know what route you want to take. And it's also very important to be very, very passionate about what you do because it's very difficult to sell something you don't believe in. If you don't believe in yourself or the product you're trying to sell or the service you're trying to sell, it's very unlikely that the receiver will be into it either. So I think that's been a really big part of what has, has got us working really yeah and I think also partly why we've worked so well is because there was two of us and I don't think you can really underestimate the power of two mm. I mean obviously people do do it by themselves but for us the power of two mm. and our different skill sets that we both brought to the table and still do now um, has been completely key mm. to us staying sane and our partner yeah. staying sane as well because <laughs> basically we didn't stop talking about it for 12 years <laughs> so at least we had someone else to listen to as opposed to driving our respective husbands mental <laughs> yeah. 
Thank you. <laughs>